Hi there. I published my novel Legacies in 2019 and I'm pleased to say that it has been quite popular. It's a multi-timeline novel about prejudice, friendship and the things we inherit materially and otherwise. Today I'm going to read the prologue and the first chapter of the novel. I hope you enjoy it and if you would like to read the rest of it, the link is in the description box below. The faceless man is there again, dressed in a cloak, and as so often before, is trying to tell me something. But although he is standing in front of me, his voice seems to come from somewhere else, somewhere a long way off or as if he is behind glass and I cannot hear him. He raises his arm as if to make a gesture and I am distracted by something hanging around his neck on a chain. It is a large, long key, beautifully made with a triple ringed bow and an intricate design on the shaft. It seems old, but looks new. I look up and I know that he is smiling. As always, when I woke from this dream, I felt happy. The man in the dream was like an old friend and I knew I could trust him. I almost felt I could hold a conversation with him right there and then, if only I could hear what he was saying. Then the sun began to shine in my eyes and I crossed back from the dream into reality. I had been having this dream for some time. It was not like other dreams. It had a reality to it. And despite now being fully awake, I still could not shake off the feeling that the man was real. Yet this morning it had been different. The key was a new development. I had not seen it before and its pewter grey remained clear in my mind as I turned over and looked at my clock radio. I lay back and sighed, the dream falling away from me into oblivion. I had just remembered that today I had to get up early to drive to Manchester for my uncle's funeral. Chapter 1 March 1985 as I watch my uncle's coffin disappear behind the curtains, I considered that cremations were a lot tidier than burials, but I wasn't sure I liked them. Life is messy and so is death. Funerals should be messy with earth and spades and people weeping by a graveside in drizzling rain. Not this clinical end with everyone sitting on plastic chairs and on their best behaviour. As the two curtains closed together, I resisted the urge to giggle. It was too theatrical and yet not in a good way. No one applauded. There was just an awkward silence as if a bad actor had just left the stage. Someone coughed politely. I glanced around the room and not for the first time in my life wondered how I came to belong to this family. There was my aunt Ada sitting bolt upright in her smart and completely appropriate black suit, neat shoes and a modest hat, her face well powdered, showing no signs of grief or sadness. I decided to give her the benefit of the doubt. It was not that she did not feel it. It was just that emotion was for private life. In a social occasion such as a funeral, one had to behave impeccably one must not let the side down. The rest of the immediate family and friends all seemed to be of the same opinion. There were no sniffles, no sound of quiet, desperate sobbing, not even a baby crying. Just the mechanised sound of the curtains as they drew together in front of the disappearing coffin. My mind drifted. I was at another funeral just five years ago in 1980. The rain dripped mournfully from the trees. The doleful sound of the vicar's voice fell flat in the damp air. I could not remember the words. And my two closest friends, Justin and Greta, stood on either side of me, 
ready to lend a steadying hand should I stumble or faint. I was still in deep shock. The two coffins being laid to rest were my parents, dead in a pile up on the M25 just one week before, and so I had not given much thought to what I should be wearing or putting on a brave face. I was just 20 and an only child. A late arrival after my parents had tried for a family for years and then given up, only to find that once they had let go of all hope of having a son or daughter, all their prayers and hopes were to be suddenly answered. My mother, Jennifer, had been a moderately successful writer of children's stories. My father, entranced by Jennifer Jepson's love of life and all things unconventional, had been rescued from a life of dreariness in a respectable banking firm to get a job in a TV production company. This had raised some eyebrows within the ranks of the straight-laced Turvey family, who had thought the banking career a, a sound and sensible one. When Peter and Jennifer's only daughter had decided to become an actress, the eyebrows belonging to that branch of the family had raised even further. The Turveys had no interest in the theatre and that a, a career in it was for idiots. The success of both my parents had allowed them to pay off their mortgage on the large old Victorian house just five minutes walk from Hampstead Heath, leaving me the outright owner on their untimely deaths. For days after the funeral I had wandered through the house, wearing one of my mother's old cardigans which still retained the smell of blue grass, her favourite perfume, I opened doors as if hoping to still find my mother sitting writing at her desk, or my father working on some carpentry project in the basement. Justin and Greta brought food and bottles of wine, and we had sat holding hands on Parliament Hill, watching the sun go down over London while I cried and talked. Eventually, the house settled around me and finally became my own. The cremation being over and my thought back to the present, we all wandered severally back to Aunt Ada's house where a buffet had been laid on. Filling my plate with as much as I could pile on, it was a long drive back to London from Manchester and there was nothing in the fridge back home, I became aware that the person next to me kept looking at me. I turned to find a young blonde haired man with sharp cheek cheekbones and intense questioning blue eyes. He smiled. Hi, he said, helping himself to slices of cold beef. Good spread, eh? It wasn't the best opening introduction, but it was refreshing to see another young person here. Most of the people here were well over 60, a whole contingency from my uncle's ex-RAF club, all blue ba blazered and dapper looking, but a little on the fragile side. My uncle had been much older than my father and had served in the RAF during the war, a connection he had maintained for the rest of his life. But this young man was different. He wore a grey suit and looked smart, but there was something slightly frayed of, at the edges about him. The suit was an old one, the trousers were flared and the cuffs on the jacket looked worn. He looked slightly out of place here and perhaps in my love of all things quirky that was the reason I found myself attracted to him. May I join you? he asked as I moved towards the one free table. Of course, please do. I had to admit to myself that I was pleased not to get stuck with my uncle's contemporaries and have to sit through discussions about the local bowling club or whose arthritis was the worst. Are you family or? he asked. Family. He was my uncle. I'm Sarah, by the way. Your uncle? His eyes seemed to widen slightly. I didn't know he even had any. On which side? Oh, my father's. But my parents died five years ago and my father was much younger. You may not have. So you're a turvy? <laughs> Yes, I grinned. My mother wanted to call me Topsy, but Dad wouldn't have it. It was an old family joke, but he didn't seem to have noticed it. He seemed suddenly far away. 
What about you? I asked. He had stopped eating for a moment, but now he glanced back at me, his eyes distant and distracted. He then refocused on his plate. Oh, me! He moved some salad around with his fork. My grandfather was your grandfather's brother. I think that makes us second cousins. I felt a pang of guilt. I had never really kept up with my extended family. Oh, my goodness, I said, chasing an olive round my plate with my fork. I'm not even sure I know what my grandfather's name was, let alone yours. I had no idea I had any cousins. I'm sorry, but I don't even know your name. Well, <laughs> that was mutual till a moment ago. My name is David Turvey. Pleased to meet you, cousin. His face had become friendly and focused again, and he held out his hand. I took it, smiling back at him. His hand was warm and dry, but not very firm. I didn't even know there was anyone of my own generation in the family, I said. The Turveys don't seem to have been blessed with the greatest ability to reproduce themselves. Before he could reply, our conversation was interrupted by the arrival of Aunt Ada, who sat down next to me. Oh, Sarah dear, I just wanted to thank you for coming all this way. Oh, that's quite all right, Aunt Ada. I wouldn't have missed it. I bit my lip. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, I, I was so sorry about Uncle Charles, but, but you're looking... I mean, how are you bearing up? Oh, I dare say I will be fine once I get rid of all these people and put my feet up with a nice cup of tea. So many people, it's just exhausting. Yes, of course. Uncle Charles must have had many friends. Sarah, dear, there was something I wanted to speak to you about. Now, your Uncle Charles, well, you know there wasn't a great deal of, well, closeness between him and your father, but all the same, he was always very, well, you know, with your passer, with your father passing away so suddenly. It was a shame, you know, that they never really met that much after your father went to London. Call me paranoid, but I heard the unspoken criticism. London was where my father had met my mother. Yes, I replied with a smile. Mum was sad about it too. She would have liked to have known Dad's family better. Well, be that as it may. Your uncle wanted you to have something. Goodness knows why. I'm not even sure you'll be interested, but it's because you're really the last of the Turveys. She looked at David, who had coughed. Oh, well, of course, not quite. <laughs> Hello, David. Ada, he nodded curtly. Well, David's a turvy too, of course, but your uncle wanted you to have it because you are his brother's daughter after all, and David is enough of family politics. I was dying to get home. But what is it, Aunt Ada? Obviously money, I thought, allowing myself a distasteful feeling of disappointment. A financial legacy would have been very useful right now given the struggle I had to maintain the house on Hampstead Heath. The roof tiles had been looking exceedingly dodgy for some time and the cost of heating the whole house meant I used only a small part of it, spending winters huddled in front of the gas fire in the living room. Oh, didn't I say? Oh, I really think my memory is going. Well, you'll think it odd, no doubt, but he wanted you to have all his notes on the Turvey family tree. At that moment, David dropped his fork on the floor and dived under the table to retrieve it, and I was unable to give him the wry look of amusement that I felt I wanted to share. I stared at my aunt instead. The family tree? Oh, yes, he's worked so hard on it for years, but it's all your side of the family, so it's of no interest to me. I've never really been into that kind of thing anyway. No. Of course not. Oh, and I nearly forgot. <laughs> Honestly, I think my mind is going. <laughs> well, it's only to be expected, I said, putting my hand on her arm. You've had a difficult time. Well, it's the silliest thing, but he was quite adamant about it. He, was, he said that there was something that your father had in his keeping that you should know about. 
and you need to look at some items, something to do with the family tree. I don't know. I'm sure there was something else too, but I can't quite. She sat staring at the ceiling. David had returned from under the table and was quietly moving food around on his plate. No, it's gone. Well, perhaps it will come back to me and perhaps it wasn't that important after all. So what is it exactly that my father had and where would I find it? Well, that's just it. I don't know. Well, some box or, or something or other. He said your father would know, but I've got... Uh, of course. You know, I think he was rambling a bit towards the end. Probably forgotten your father was no longer with us. I'm sure there was something else. But there you are, old age catching up with me. Probably nothing important. I will pop upstairs and get the papers for you before you go. I looked at David, who had abandoned his plate and was sitting very still. What do you make of that? I said as Ada went off to talk to Charles's RAF friends. David shrugged and made a sort of half laugh. I took a sip of wine. The turvy family tree and some kind of something that was in my father's keeping but I didn't know what or where. Well, thanks for nothing, Uncle Charles, I thought. And then mentally told myself not to be so mean. I'd quite liked Uncle Charles. He'd had a sense of humour and I found myself feeling sad that I had never had a chance to know him properly. Back home, Justin and Greta had turned up on my doorstep with an Indian takeaway, knowing I'd had a long drive and probably had nothing in the larder to eat. And we had demolished it quickly with groans of enjoyment. Justin topped up my glass from the second bottle of wine that evening and I sank back, back onto the sofa. That was one of the best Indian meals ever. I feel like I don't want to eat for another week. Thanks, guys. Oh, don't mention it, said Greta, who was sitting or half reclining on a pile of cushions on the floor. That's what friends are for. We bring food, we eat, we drink. Everybody is happy. She waved her arm in the air as if dismissing any further comment and a slight aroma of patchouli wafted into the air, mixing exotically with the smell of tandoori chicken and onion bhajis. Justin, having replenished all of our glasses, sat down on the ancient armchair on the other side of the gas fire that sat in front of the unused fireplace, crossing his legs and placing his glass carefully on the coaster he had put onto the coffee table next to him. He leaned back into the chair. What a mess! said, surveying the array of metal containers, half-eaten poppadoms and dirty plates and cutlery. We should clear up, really. Nobody moved. In a little while, I said, I just want to let that tandoori chicken settle and I might just finish off those poppadoms anyway, um, in a minute. Ugh, how could you, groaned Greta. I have eaten too much. Always the eyes are too big for the stomach and then the suffering. I smiled. Ah oh, yes, the suffering. We must always have the suffering. I clapped my hand to my head in mock drama. Greta threw a cushion at me. Don't mock. I can't help it. Suffering is in my genes. <laughs> Justin laughed. Honestly, Greta, you're a bigger drama queen than I am. Life is a drama. Anyone who doesn't know that is already dead. Sarah, give me that cushion back. I need it. I threw the cushion back at her. So, how did the funeral go, Sarah? asked Justin. Oh, oh how I hate funerals, groaned Greta. Well, you would have found this one a little lacking in drama. My God, it was like everything was cling film wrapped and served on a sterilised plate. And I'm not just talking about the food. Uncle Charles was sent off very tidily wrapped up and in an orderly fashion. There was no weeping or any emotional nonsense like that. Oh well, said Justin. I suppose that's the way some people like to deal with death. Make it into something they can handle. An event to be organised and prepared. It's the only way they can feel they're still in control. 
Don't forget, I've been to a few recently. He looked away at the fire, and I knew that he was thinking of Mark, as well as a few other friends who had died of AIDS within the last couple of years. I know. I reached over and touched his arm. But you're so sweet, Justin. You always see the best in people. I just wonder sometimes how this family is part of me. We're so different. Well, I don't know about David. He's a cousin I never knew I had. He was okay, I think. Anyway, he seemed to like me. He took my phone number anyway, I ended, grinning into my wine. Greta sat up and Justin looked up, twitching an eyebrow. Oh, really? Mm, now that sounds more interesting. Kissing cousins, eh? Oh, don't jump to conclusions, Justin. He lives miles away. He was quite good looking, I suppose, but I don't know. Well, sounds like this funeral had more drama in it than you're letting on. Anything else you'd like to tell us? There was something a bit odd. My uncle left me something, but the most bizarre thing. I've no idea what I'm going to do with it. What is it? The Turvey family history. Greta sank back on her cushions with a disappointed grunt, but Justin leaned forward. Well, it may not be worth anything, but it might be interesting. You think? Apparently there's something I should look at that my father was in possession of, but Aunt Ada had no idea what it was. What good is that to me? If it was important to your uncle, it might be worth finding out. Oh, I do love a good mystery. Didn't she say anything else? Not really. Just that there was something in a box. I suppose it could be something stored in the attic, but there could be hundreds of boxes up there. Might be looking for a needle in a haystack. It might be fun to look. Yeah, perhaps. Do you think it might be some dark family secret? I've no idea. Aunt Ada didn't say. But why did he mention it as part of my grand legacy of the family tree, I wonder? Oh, darling, this is so exciting. Let's have a look at it all and see if we can find something. Greta had been silent throughout this exchange. Now she got up and started clearing up the food to detritus. But I'm going to do the washing up. You children stay here and talk about your family histories. I don't want to know. It's just all dead people. What's the point? It's all in the past, dead and buried. Oh, Greta, we'll help. No, oh, no, I'll be happy in the kitchen. It won't take long. Then I'll go home. It's getting on for eight and I need to work on some designs. I've got a deadline to meet next week. After Greta had left the room, I exchanged looks with Justin. I'd forgotten what she's like about death and families and stuff. Do you think she's okay? Justin smiled. Greta's always more okay than she thinks she is. All the same, I can't imagine what it must have been like to have all that in your background. Imagine if all of your grandparents had died in the gas chambers of Auschwitz and your parents had only just managed to escape the same fate. I can't even begin to. And they never knew what happened to the uncle, did they? Her father's uncle. He disappeared after he got her parents out of Germany. God knows what happened to him. We did not speak for a few minutes. Both Justin and I had suffered loss, but Greta's family had fared far worse. I said, I'll wait until Greta's gone, and then we'll have a look at that tree. The family history papers that Ada had passed on to me consisted of a very large ring binder full of notes a few sepia photographs of rather stiff looking people staring at the camera as if, face, as if facing execution, and a long roll of paper which we laid out on the carpet using a collection of ashtrays and mugs at corners to hold it down. Long horizontal lines sprawled across the paper with each generation shown under short vertical lines. Hundreds of names and dates were written in small, neat handwriting. My God, he's done a lot of work, I said. I wonder where he got all this information from. 
church records and Somerset House, most of it. Oh, is it St Catherine's House now? It's where you can order birth and marriage certificates. Oh, you seem to know a lot about it. Oh, I know somebody who is into genealogy. She's a friend of my mother's. In her 40s, her husband's a lawyer. It started off as a hobby and now she gets paid to investigate other people's family history. I looked down at the tree, searching for my own name. It wasn't difficult to find. It stood out at the bottom, one little line coming down from Peter Turfey and Jennifer Jepson. There were no, th no other names on my generation, except a few inches away, my newly discovered cousin David, son of David Turvey, the son of Stephen George Turvey, brother of Henry John Turvey, my grandfather. Well, said Justin, some of these lines go right back to the 17th century. I read the names at the top of the tree. Geoffrey Turvey. What does BAP mean? Oh, it's short for baptised, I think. Ah, then baptised in 1639 Woburn. That's Bedfordshire, isn't it? Amazing. M must be short for married. 1660 to Agnes Field. I suppose that's how they spelled Agnes. Wow, look at all those children. The old Turveys had a bit more lead in their pencils in those days, obviously. Yeah, that's one way of putting it, I suppose. No family planning, of course. He certainly got a lot of information on each person, particularly in the 19th century. All the wives had their surnames and parents written in, and they seemed to be cross-referenced to the ring binder with more notes and family trees on each one. Uh oh, except this one. He flipped through the ring binder again. No, there's nothing about her at all. He pointed to a single name on the page, five generations up from me, the wife of one of my direct ancestors, Edward Turvey. Unlike the other wives, she did not have a surname and no details of her birth or parents. Elizabeth, nothing else. Looks like he wasn't able to find anything out about her. So she was my, I counted up the generations, great, great, great grandmother. That's odd. All the other direct female ancestors have lots of notes on when and when they were born and some of them he's researched right back so they have trees of their own. There's nothing for her, not even anything to say whether there are any clues. He's just put in Edward Turvey's notes that there's a possible marriage date of around 1853. He did not find a marriage certificate or anything in the registers. The census gives her place of birth as Gloucestershire in about 1827, but that's all he knows. Bit of a mystery then. Five children and the first one was my great-great-grandfather. For the first time I felt a flutter of excitement in my stomach, but I could not explain why. Oh, it's funny, isn't it? I said. All these people, just names and dates on a page, seemingly meaningless. And yet they all had lives. They all had pain, suffered grief and loss, fell in love, out of love, married, had children, got ill, died. Some of them no doubt had secret love affairs. Some perhaps committed crimes or inflicted cruelty. Perhaps some were heroes. They were all made of flesh with thoughts and feelings and problems just like you and me. Yet they've all been reduced to just this, a name on a piece of paper with dates attached and a few side notes. Do you think that's all will be one day? What a depressing thought, said Justin. I suppose the least we can hope for is to have more than a paragraph written about us in a scruffy ring binder. Well, one paragraph is more than poor old Elizabeth Turvey got. I wonder who she was. Perhaps you could find out. For a moment, I felt a tingle of excitement, but it soon disappeared. If Uncle Charles couldn't find out anything about her, I don't know how I could. Hmm, I guess so. So what about that box? 
Do you think it has anything to do with all of this? Are you going to do anything about it tonight? Like what? Anyway, I'm too tired. I yawned. It's been a long day and I don't see there's much point. It's probably nothing. Justin looked at me, barely hiding an expression of exasperation. Or it could be something. But what? My darling, I have absolutely no idea. He rolled onto his back. Anyway, it's too late to go looking now. I forgot to tell you. What? I have a date. What? I sat up. Justin hadn't been on a date for two years. With the dreaded unmentionable virus that had been making its way through his circle of friends, it was terrifying to even contemplate any kind of relationship. Tell me all, I said. Who is he? Why didn't you tell me before? I didn't tell you because I knew you'd all be, tell me, tell me. And of course I was right. Honestly, it's nothing. It's, it's just a drink. We met at the Vauxhall Tavern, as you do. He works as a dresser at the Barbican, so he finishes work late. And I said I'd meet him in town for a quick drink after work. Really, it's nothing. Then why did you tell me? I teased, poking him in the stomach. Because I wanted to work on this with you, but I have to go, otherwise I'll be late. He got to his feet and held out his hand to help me up. What's his name? Graham. Really, don't make anything of it. I think he's a bit flaky anyway. I'm not sure he's really my type. I closed the front door after watching Justin walk up the road towards the tube station and offered a silent prayer for him to stay safe. Then I came back to the family tree laid out on the floor. I looked at all those names, all those people who had lives, all gone. What was the point of looking? There was enough to deal with in the present without digging up the past. Perhaps Greta was right. There was another thing that disturbed me too. All the names on the paper seemed to be mocking me. Their lives were no doubt all filled with purpose and success. Even my parents who had been different to the rest had had shining, creative and successful lives until they had been cruelly cut short. Why was I the black sheep? What had all these people to do with me, really? Even if there was some family secret in a box somewhere in the attic, what good would that be to me? What I needed now was a job, something to tell me that I was on the right track, something to tell me that I wasn't wasting my life audition after audition with no work to speak of except the occasional fringe production that promised a share of profits, <laughs> profits that were usually non-existent. What use did I have for a family tree no more than a list of dead people, as Greta would have said, and some box of boring documents that I would probably never find. And even if I did, what then? It was hardly going to be a treasure chest that would make my fortune or some magic wand that would make me an overnight successful actress. No, it wasn't worth it. It would mean a search through the attic, through my parents' things. Five years had gone by, but the thought of going through all those old documents and bits and pieces was still too much to bear. I drained the dregs of my glass of wine and took a last look at the family tree before rolling it up and putting it at the back of the cupboard at the bottom of the dresser. Then I turned off the light and went to bed. So, Want to find out what's in that box? And what's the significance of the mysterious woman in the family tree? Why all the mystery? Well, you can buy the paperback or the Kindle book on Amazon using the link below. And if you would like to hear more readings and learn more about me, my writing and updates about upcoming publications, then please hit the subscribe button. And I will also always be happy to hear from you in the comments box. Bye for now.